May 7th. We are approaching the peak of tornado season and not very much going on. A very blocky pattern across the U.S., a distinct lack of zonal flow. As a result, we don't get that moisture return that's very dependent on the lee side trough east of the Rockies. And with a blocky pattern, the strong vertical shear is divided out in a more piecemeal fashion. Anyway, let's look at that upper level flow and check it out visually. This afternoon, the main band of the polar front jet is up in Canada, the southern stream running from northern Mexico into the southeast, but only about 40 to 50 knots at 500 millibars. And we can see that's divided up into a couple of upper level lows, one in Arizona and the other in Kansas. And take a look at that flow perpendicular to the Rockies. Five knots, that's about it. And this is a conceptual model for the development of the classic low-level jet. Once we get that strong west-to-east component over the Rockies, we develop that lee side trough that's it right there. And the low-level jet develops in response to that, bringing up moisture and high theta E values. And as all those contrasts come together, the dry line also gets involved and we get our synoptically driven severe weather situation. So let's look at our crystal ball. There's our cold core low across Kansas and Oklahoma. Any low level jet is gonna be further out to the southeast where there is a little bit of synoptic support. However, on the Great Plains, pretty much northerly flow in place, a low level jet up to the north in response to that northern stream system through the prairies, but the Gulf is gonna be shut down. Look at that flow offshore for Friday and into the weekend. So this is gonna be a stout cold air advection pattern. Only by Monday do we start getting a classic return flow setup. You can see that lee side troughing starting to develop there, cyclogenesis out in the Rockies. And finally, by midweek, we're starting to look at a little bit more of a classic setup. Thursday, one good push of dynamics into the Northern Plains, and then another surge for the following weekend. For today on the surface map, kind of a three-tiered pattern. A transitional air mass through the central U.S. into the eastern states, temperatures in the 60s and 70s. The true tropical air well to the south and up to the north, a fresh incursion of Canadian air. And out in the Pacific Northwest, a hint of a strong push of cold air from the North Pacific. Across the northeastern U.S. this afternoon, a departing upper-level low across New England and western Maine. Temperatures at 500 millibars down to minus 20, helping to produce this thunderstorm activity approaching Portland. Showers all the way back into the mountains of the New England region. Temperatures in the 60s through that entire area and up to the 80s in Virginia. In the Great Lakes, cool conditions flowing back in behind. Afternoon highs in the 50s, but down in the Midwest region, we warm up to the 70s and 80s. But those cold weather problems responsible for a few frost advisories for tonight for Lower Michigan, Traverse City to Alpena, and also in central Wisconsin around Wausau and Stevens Point. Temperatures could be down to about 32. In the southeastern region, quiet conditions. Again, we are divided into two main areas, the true tropical air down in the Gulf and in Florida and up north, more of a transitional air mass. Temperatures up there, rather cool, upper 60s in Tennessee in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And then further south, we pick up the 80s and even low 90s for central Florida. The Storm Prediction Center has a marginal risk along coastal Georgia down into the Jacksonville area, Titusville, and Orlando due to isolated potential for high wind and hail. The current radar out of Jacksonville does show a well-developed cluster of thunderstorms moving east, a new area of convection further south in between Orlando and Jacksonville, and those should continue developing for the next few hours. A rather extensive area of convection in the central gulf off the southern Alabama coast, making its way eastward. And that was the result of this cluster of storms that moved out of the Texas and Louisiana coastal waters. Now let's go back to this morning, take a look at the northern edge of this cloud field, and 
you can see that moving northward and forming kind of a gravity wave across the Ohio River Valley. Here's a, another look at that. There it is surging through Memphis and then Paducah. And here it is, that little gravity wave, little oscillation in the buoyancy field being carried with the upper level flow. Flood watches continue through the central Gulf Coast region from Mobile to Beaumont. Even though it's looking pretty good right now, other rounds of rain possible Thursday, and we could see another one to three inches. Many of the rivers from the Natchez and Trinity to the Pearl River in Mississippi running at flood stage due to all the rain, the worst problems on the Mississippi River in Louisiana, where we're seeing moderate to major flood stage. Fortunately, that's on the decline as that water gradually drains out into the Gulf. Cold core showers and storms popping up across Kansas and northern Oklahoma this afternoon. You can actually see the spin in the precipitation field signifying the approximate location of the upper level low. The Storm Prediction Center has a marginal risk of severe all through that area due to a low end risk of hail and an isolated tornado. I should actually qualify that. That's mostly going to be eastern Oklahoma into Arkansas. Let's try to get a closer look with the Tulsa radar. Modest capes only in the 500 to 1000 range. We could see a couple of low top supercells in this kind of pattern. No mesoscale convective discussions or watches have been issued yet. Temperatures all through this area in the 60s and 70s. 60s for the panhandles and further south, 90s as you might expect popping up in south Texas. Laredo very hard to get away from 90s and 100s this time of year. In the northern tier states, not much going on, 60s for the most part, but we did see a band of 80s from Yankton, Sioux City, through Iowa and Illinois. Further north, those frost advisories up there in Wisconsin, Lake Wind Advisory in Montana, Fort Peck Lake, south winds gusting the 35 miles an hour. Uh, what day is that? Yeah, that's for today. I had to double check that. Don't want to be passing on bad information. Fire weather watch for tomorrow in western North Dakota due to windy conditions and dry thunderstorms. In the Rocky Mountains, cool conditions as a cold air mass prevails. Denver was looking for a high of 58 this afternoon. Upslope flow, adiabatic cooling, keeping those temperatures down in addition to the cloud cover and cold advection. 50s all the way down to Alamosa, Trinidad, and Lamar very rare to see highs in the 50s this time of year in southeastern Colorado. Usually that's a hot spot. Warmer west of the Continental Divide, we're seeing temperatures in the 60s and 70s this afternoon. The southwest deserts, well, there is an upper level low. See that little spin in the air right there? However, temperatures are coming up into the low to mid 80s. Same story for the San Joaquin Valley, Los Angeles 69 with that marine layer pushing inland. Let's take a look at that. And there it is. You can see how far that stratus and stratocumulus has advanced, but it appears to be burning off and the temperature is coming up a little bit this afternoon. And in the Pacific Northwest, warm conditions east of the Cascades, 80s around Yakima, Pasco, and Pendleton, 70s in Portland, 60s in Seattle, and offshore cold advection. So we've got this area of clouds in between, and that indicates we've got a frontal system somewhere in the area. And there it is. Okay, so the cold air advection following right back in there. This is a anafront setup, very common for that part of the country. Stormy in the Gulf of Alaska, but kind of a weak low pressure area, very broad. And Alaska itself looking pretty good. Marine advisories off the west and northern coast. Northeasterly flow driving onto the north slope. That cold air persists across Baffin Island into the Canadian high Arctic temperatures into the single digits from Resolute to Ox Point. And down in the Canadian prairies, warm conditions, a little bit of downslope flow through Alberta, temperatures in the 70s, but cold air moving into Ontario, a cold afternoon with highs down into the 30s and 40s. Most of our problems are out in Labrador and Newfoundland through this area here. We could see heavy rains in 
the Rocky Harbor area of Newfoundland, one to two inches expected there. Further north, sleet and freezing rain across southern Labrador with up to four to eight inches of snow from Goose Bay to Paradise River. All right, let's go ahead and look at the forecast, and we'll start with the Q vectors and the 500 millibar heights. So what we see here is one wave moving through Arizona that's associated with that low-pressure area loft that I pointed out, and we've got another wave through the lower Mississippi River Valley, and then going through tomorrow, Thursday, and Friday, one wave moving across Texas. Not sure if that's going to have much in the way of effects because the air mass has dried out a little bit. It would be a different story if we had tropical air in place, but there could be effects down there in South Texas and the Western Gulf. Another wave moving through the eastern Great Lakes, but a lot of ridging extending from the western U.S. into the northern high plains, and that will keep the temperature on the high side. It does appear that we shear off this trough towards the weekend down into the Gulf Coast area, so this whole region will be unsettled going into the latter half of this week. And then this is where we start opening up that polar front jet in the western U.S., and that gradually advances into the Rockies going into midweek next week. Look at those strong dynamics, very strong waves moving through the western U.S. Of course, most of the initial effects will be in the northern plains, but gradually as we dump out this broad area of westerlies into the central plains, we'll see those effects advance southward very gradually. And if you were watching very closely, those strong mid-level winds start entering the southern Rockies and the Four Corners area as early as Wednesday. And that's all we need to get that low-level jet underway. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we could see the dry line start to become active through much of the Great Plains, even as far south as Texas. And of course, it all comes down to the thermodynamics, the amount of available moisture, the capping, and Anyway, we'll take a look at that next week. For tonight, however, numerous showers and thunderstorms through Missouri. This little frontal boundary helping also. And as we go into tomorrow, Thursday, we are looking for numerous showers and storms once again from the Ozarks along this frontal boundary into the central Appalachians, far eastern Tennessee and Kentucky. And we do have a slight risk of severe thunderstorms there. And we do have a slight risk of severe thunderstorms centered around Asheville and the Tri-Cities area right in there. We're looking for high wind and large hail as we get good instability with moderate amounts of shear. But the air mass not really all that well capped, so any of the severe weather will favor the initial stages of development before we get upscale growth into clusters. The remainder of the southeastern U.S. good chances for showers as we get that afternoon heating. Big warm-up for the Dakotas, widespread mid-80s from Bismarck to Minot, and this will be a multi-day event for the Northern Plains that runs through midweek next week. The Storm Prediction Center has a slight risk of severe thunderstorms in the lower Rio Grande Valley along that frontal boundary, limited instability that should curb widespread severe weather potential, but all hazards are possible. For Friday, most of our precipitation should be up and down the Atlantic Corridor and up into New England. The Storm Prediction Center does have a moderate risk of severe from the coastal Carolinas into southern Georgia and northern Florida. Cold air flows into Texas, Oklahoma, the Arklatex, highs in the 70s from Arkansas to north Texas, and a heat wave beginning in the southwest widespread 100s, Phoenix up to 102, Yuma 103. Then we go into Saturday, rainy through the southeastern U.S., some frontogenetic forcing adding to the mix. Texas, one of the very last cool weekends, lots of 70s Saturday and Sunday for high temperatures, and a heat wave continues in the southwestern U.S., highs up to 105 at Phoenix and 107 at Yuma, and this could be the first 110-degree day in Death Valley. Bakersfield could be up near 100 as well. As we go into Sunday and Monday, precipitation on the increase in the northwestern U.S. Rainy weather continues across the southeast, and I'll just take you through the rest of the sequence. Very slow push on this air mass through the western U.S. into midweek, so it will modify extensively and not much left of it when it rolls out onto the Great Plains. 
but the flow is out of the south and we could see thunderstorms along that front or the dry line. And we go into Thursday and Friday, continued unsettled through the southwestern U.S. You can see these ribbons of thickness, so we do have the potential for strong dynamics in the Great Plains going into late next week. This is a very approximate look at what's happening, but I do think, based on the large-scale pattern, we do have severe weather potential through the Great Plains somewhere. In closing, a huge thanks to all of you whether you support me on Patreon or just hang out in the comments. Patreon support, that's what lets me focus on creating videos instead of writing books and software. If you can chip in on Patreon, even a few dollars a month, that makes a huge difference. But no pressure, I know not everybody can contribute. Some of you are students, maybe your work in retail or on fixed income, and that's 100% okay. But if you're not contributing, liking and leaving comments is very much appreciated. So that's one way you can help the program succeed. Either way, thank you for being here. And on that note, thanks to our newest supporter, Chris Wallace. We'll be back here once again on Friday for another edition. Take care, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye.